Hello, my name is Valentin Kavanets. I'll be doing this tutorial on compl complexity around SAT. Um, satisfiability is really such an important problem in complexity. All complexity theorists love SAT. And I'm hoping to show you some of the things um, which make SAT such a favorite with complexity theorists. And for me, the topic of this tutorial is more like dancing around satisfiability because doing complexity often feels like dancing around SAT. And I'm hoping to tell you some basics about SAT, uh, its importance because of NP-completeness and its connections to other complexity classes and other research directions in complexity. So you see in this picture different things that we'll be talking about starting with the basics and the completeness, and then moving on to things like polynomial time hierarchy, interactive proofs, PCP theorem, and so forth, and some more advanced topics like lower bounds for satisfiability, um, exponential time hypothesis, approximate counting, uniform generation of sat witnesses, and learning. So there's a lot of stuff to cover, really, and. Uh, uh, saying that this is sat center complexity theory is really like not saying much because I can still talk about everything in computational complexity pretty much. So let's start at the beginning, the anti-completeness of sat. That's uh, where sat made its entrance into the complexity world uh, with this big bang. Um, people realize that satisfiability is such an important problem. And then complexity theory from then on, from where it happened in 1971, exactly 50 years ago, from then on, SAT has become a central figure, central character in this complexity saga. So Steve Cook and Leonid Levin proved that through satisfiability is NP-complete. So I'll explain things fairly slow. So let's start with three sat. What is a three sat? You're given a CNF formula like this one here. Uh, you see each clause contains a disjunction of three literals, a variable or a negation of a variable. You have conjunctions of such clauses of size three, and that's your three CNF, conjunctive normal form with each clause of size three. And the basic question, given such a formula, such a 3CNF, is it satisfiable? Where, of course, satisfiable means that you can assign true-false value to the propositional variables, x1, x2, x3, and so forth, true-false value such that when you evaluate the formula, it becomes true. So is it possible to satisfy a given formula? And we don't know how to do that. And we didn't know how to do that back in 1971 or even, of course, before then. So the natural question is, is there a polynomial time algorithm for deciding satisfiability of three CNFs? Why three? Well, if you go lower than three to say two CNFs, then we do know how to solve those in polynomial time. So if your clauses are with two rather than three, then there is a non-trivial but not very complicated polynomial time algorithm for solving this task. But three seems to have a monumental challenge for uh, computer algorithms, for efficient computer algorithms. So what's going on? And basically, Cook and Levin independently showed that the reason why 3 side is so difficult is because basically it has very many different faces. If you can solve 3 satisfiability in polynomial time, that then you not only do you get an algorithm for, for three satisfiability, but you get a polynomial time algorithm for a whole class of seemingly different problems. And this class has a name, NP, stands for non-deterministic polynomial time, and contains tons of interesting problems that people care about and have been looking at for quite some time before the discovery of NP completeness in 1971. So I want to explain P, N, P, N, P completeness. So let me start even before 1971, uh, going back to 1930s and the definition of a Turing machine, because talk about polynomial time algorithms, so we need to fix some model of computation. 
and Turing machine is the most convenient one and still the model of computation primarily used in complexity theory to talk about efficiency or inefficiency of solving different problems. So Turing machine is a very simple model of computation. It's a computational device which has an infinite tape partitioned into cells. You see blank symbol, zero, zero, one, those are separate symbols and uh, separate taped cells. And it has a finite control, which on the one hand scans the tape in a particular tape cell. You see here it scans uh, position with symbol zero. And it's in some state um, out of finitely many states. Right now it's in state Q. And the main part of the Turing machine description, of course, is a program, a program telling the machine what to do. And the program basically looks like the following kinds of uh, commands, if then else statements. It says that if your current state is something and you see a particular symbol, then update your state to maybe something new, update the symbol that you're uh, looking at, scanning uh, to something new or keep it the same, and then move on the tape position to the right or position to the left. Okay, so in this case, for example, after looking at the symbol zero, we can maybe replace it with a one and start looking at uh, next symbol on the right-hand side. And I won't be using this uh, that much, but I'll just mention that you have a special initial state, Q naught, and you have special halting state, Q accept, which signals that you accepted a given input. So you say yes, or Q reject, which means that you reject a given input. The important thing about the Turing machine model, and this will be a theme uh, central to complexity theory from then on, from 1970s on. And in particular, that's the property that was exploited in the proof of Kuklevin's theorem, as I'm gonna show to you. It's the locality of computation. The Turing machine model uh, presents very local view of what's happening with the state of um, computation. So if you look at the tape, you scan a particular symbol of the tape, what happens will be centered in that tape cell location, or maybe it's immediate neighbor, immediate neighbor to the left or immediate neighbor on the right. Everything else stays untouched as it was before. So the action is happening very locally. We'll come back to this point in a moment when we'll discuss the Turing machine, um, the proof of cook levin theorem for the Turing machine model. The time complexity of the Turing machine is naturally defined as the number of computation steps, the number of transitions you make, the number of commands in this table of uh, commands uh, that the Turing machine has that you need to take before you reach an accepting or rejecting state. We ignore here the halting, non-halting issues. We assume that all the Turing machines will be timed uh, so that they will always terminate. Now we can define a class P as a class of, as a class of uh, polynomial time solvable problems. Problems, yes, no decision problems solvable by polynomial time running deterministic Turing machines. So far, everything is deterministic. And P on the other hand, stands for the class of those problems which are also solvable in polynomial time, but in a different, more general computational model of so-called non-deterministic Turing machines. And the difference between deterministic and non-deterministic is that the program uh, has more options for the then statement. Here, deterministically, you say, okay, if the situation was like so before, if this is what happened before, then in the next step, step of the computation, this is what must happen. But in a non-deterministic machine case, you may have options. You may have uh, do this or do that or do that, some constant number of options. And then non-deterministic machine will have to choose which of those options to follow. And we imagine that kind of different machines are created that follow different options. So this is not a model that you can easily implement. And the whole point of this non model is that it's a conceptual thing rather than an actual thing you can implement in practice. And defining NP this way, of course, is perfectly fine. Uh, but personally, I prefer the following equivalent way of defining NP, where you have a certain game between a prover and a verifier. Both of them are given an input x 
binary strength, say, of certain length. And the prover is trying to convince the verifier that the string is uh, accepted, uh, should be part of the, of the language or should be yes instance of your problem in question. And the prover will send a witness to the verifier and the witness is some binary string of not too long length of polynomial length in the length of X. And the verifier will look at the input X and will look at the uh, witness sent by the prover and will accept or reject accordingly. And we say that X is accepted by this prover verifier pair if and only if the verifier will accept uh, the input X and the witness Y provided by the prover. And note that the verifier here is completely deterministic polynomial time algorithm. Of course, um, you can think of this as a non-deterministic computation where um, the prover is the non-deterministic part of the, of the algorithm. So you're non-deterministically guessing this witness Y of polynomial, of polynomial length, and then you deterministically check the guessed witness for being correct or not correct. As a simple illustration of the point is, uh, let's, look one, uh, let's look at 3SAT and see why 3SAT is in NP. Uh, here, the input to the prover verifier will be a 3CNF formula phi, let's say in some variables x1 through xn. And the witness, of course, will be a candidate satisfying assignment, which is an n bit binary string. And the verifier's job is very easy. It looks at formula phi, looks at the witness y sent by the prover and makes sure that this is a satisfying assignment that phi of y is actually equal to one. As, as all this uh, is common, I will identify true with one, false with zero and talk about Boolean functions, true, false predicates uh, as the same things. Okay. To talk about NP-completeness, we still need to define more things. We need to talk about the notion of reduction, which helps us to compare the computational difficulties of the problem. Reductions are really the main thing that complexity theories study. So you say that the problem A is polynomial time reducible to a problem B, where a problem is simply a collection of binary strings out of all possible binary strings. So it's a um, collection of yes instances of a problem, if you like. So we say problem A is reducible to B in polynomial time if there exists a way, um, there's a polynomial time mapping, an algorithm, polynomial time algorithm, which maps strings to strings, such that for every string X, X is in the problem on the left, X is in A, if and only if the value of the reduction R of X is a member of the problem on the right. So X is in A, if and only if R of X is in B. And here's a picture you see that our reduction is supposed to map instances, yes instances of A to yes instances of B and no instances of A must be mapped to no instances of B. Okay, so reductions somehow maps yes to yes, no to no. And it's not hard to see, and that's the whole point of uh, having such reduction is that if a problem A is reducible to B in polynomial time, and if the problem B itself can be solved in polynomial time, then together the reduction plus the algorithm for the problem B give you a polynomial time algorithm for problem A. Okay, so that's uh, what I meant by saying that A is easier than B uh, if you have a reduction from A to B. And finally, we can define the notion of NP-completeness as uh, follows. The problem B, say, is called NP-complete. If it's a member of the class NP, it has this prover verifier definition. And every other problem A in the class NP is easier than B. So every other problem A in the class NP is polynomial time reducible to B. So what it means is that an NP-complete problem is like the hardest problem in the class NP. It is a member of the class, condition one, and everything else in the class is reducible to it efficiently in polynomial time. So if you have an NP-complete problem and if suddenly you can solve it in polynomial time, then everything in non realistic polynomial time also becomes solvable in polynomial time. 
And now we can state the Cook-Levin theorem with all the notation uh, defined. So Cook, -Levin, Cook and Levin prove that three satisfiability is NP complete. To prove this, I'm gonna give you a proof of this, at least some level of detail. We'll need to show the following. We'll need to give a generic way of saying, if I have a problem A in non-organistic polynomial time, then there will be a polynomial time efficient reduction capital R, which will map access to inputs X, which are instances of problem A, to formulas, which I denote by phi sub X, in some variables Y, so that by the definition of reduction, access in the problem A is a yes instance of a problem A, if and only if uh, the formula phi sub x is a yes instance of three sat, which of course means that phi sub x is a satisfiable three CNF. Actually, what we'll show will be something stronger. Uh, we'll pay attention not only to the uh, fact that we have a reduction, but we want also to measure the size of the formula phi of x, phi sub x, as a function of the input length of x. And we'll show the following result. If I have a language A in non deterministic polynomial time, in some specific non deterministic time T of n, so think of T of n as quadratic, cubic, or linear, if you like. So then I ha I'll have a reduction that will map input x of length n to a 3CNF formula phi sub x, satisfying the condition of the reductions as usual, x is in A if and only if the formula phi sub x is in 3 sat, but also the size of the formula phi sub x will be almost linear in the runtime of the algorithm for A. So algorithm for A, non -risk algorithm for A was running in time T. Then the size of the formula phi sub x that we'll get as a result of this reduction will be almost T. It will be big O of T times log T. So it's quasi-linear, almost linear in running time. And that's as efficient as we know how to do it at the moment. The proof of this is not anything new. It's fairly well known, but the usual proof that people normally see when they talk about empty completeness in the basic uh, course on algorithms or complexity is that this, they built the size of uh, the formula whose size is quadratic in the runtime. So they get uh, the size of the phi sub x formula be about big O of t squared. Actually, will prove a somewhat stronger result. We'll talk not about non deterministic time t, but about deterministic time t, which, jumping ahead a little bit, is not really much of a difference because we can define non deterministic polynomial time using the deterministic verifier, and we all need to worry about this deterministic verifier algorithm. Okay, so we'll prove that for deterministic time t computation, we can build an equivalent circuit of size almost t. So time t is in circuit size t log t. So basically we have efficient simulation of algorithms by circuits. And the two objects are represented in this picture that you see on the slide right now. On the left-hand side, you have a Turing machine and the input to the Turing machine uh, let's fix some input length n. So a particular input is some sequence of n bits, x equal to x1 through xn. And the Turing machine is whatever, standard uh, uh, small computation um, description with if statements saying if state this and symbol this, then state that and symbol that and so forth. And you have a movement left or right each time. We've seen that before. Uh, on the other hand, um, the circuit computing the answer, uh, the same answer, yes, no, that a tree machine uh, would compute is the following object. It has logical connectives. In this case, it's negations, uh, conjunctions, and ors. We call them gates, logical gates, not gates, and gate or gates. And they form this graph and you have inputs fed into your circuit. You have n inputs coming in 
And then the signal propagates to the circuit in the obvious way. Each gate computes the end of its incoming signals and the information is traveling from top to down. And the last output gate of the circuit is the bottom gate in this picture, which gives you the final answer from the circuit. And so what we want to show is that if I have a uniform tuning machine computation model where tuning machine runs on inputs of length n and takes time t, t of n, then I can build a circuit, moreover efficiently construct from the definition of the tuning machine, a circuit that will do the exact same thing, accept the same inputs and reject the same inputs as the tuning machine would. And the size of that circuit measured as the number of gates in this graph will be at most t times log t. Okay, so from that, as we shall see, and for now, just believe me that it's possible, it will be easy consequence uh, that we can show that we can deduce Cook Levin's theorem from that result that allows you to simulate algorithms with Boolean circuits. Okay, and we'll do that next.